things, things work and then one day they break. Uh, so um, welcome for today for our eight working group meeting, um, which uh, we'll have to hurry up to finish in time. <laughs> Uh, obviously, there is now a Zoom session, uh, and if you don't mind uh, pressing the record button, Edo, to um, make sure that we can put this on the website later on. Yeah, it's already being recorded. Thank you. Um, so, our agenda is uh, a little bit full as usual. Um, so, we, we'll start off with progress since our last meeting. Um, which uh, I was, when I was preparing all the slides, uh, there are in some sense too many because the, you know, I was happy to see that we've done quite a lot of things, but I, I'll have to rush through them. And there, you can always ask questions if there is anything that you want to know more about. Uh, then we're going to have a discussion on our results of our user survey and uh, a very brief uh, update on the Phantom subgroup and then a discussion on patient data. We'll try and start at 11.45 roughly uh, because that's when uh, Alex Amers will uh, try to dial in, uh, skipping a few of his older meetings at the edge. Then some discussion on future activities. So just to remind everybody, our end date is end of March 2020. So we have about, well, 16 months left. Uh, and, uh, so I'll start with the previous activities. The, we had uh, two regular software developer meetings, uh, again with about 17 and 20 people. And then we also had our hackathon on which I have a different slide that was our first hackathon, which uh, was at RHEL in August. And we have our two weekly developer TCOMs, uh, which are usually around five people there, and then we have some changes. So on the first hackathon, I uh, was uh, largely organized by Edo, was at uh, RAL. We had 14 people coming all the way from uh, Australia and uh, uh, Germany, uh, and that was a fortunate uh, timing with two exchanges that we had from people over there. So that was, uh, I don't think otherwise people would come from Australia. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, so we had three teams there, which you see on the slide. And uh, the over, uh, that's a picture of us uh, visiting uh, RAL itself. Um, you can see everybody there. Uh, it's nice to be able to visit a site like that. Well, thinking about the software, not the other one. So I thought that the overall feedback from the meeting was quite positive. Uh, we thought that two days was, was good, although obviously maybe a little bit short. Um, and we all felt that we need to organize another hackathon in six months time, which is why uh, we're going to have one uh, in about two weeks, I guess, uh, on which more at the end of the meeting. Um, there are a few technical things there on, on what we thought that, that might need to change uh, in how we run it. And I also think that the next hackathon will be slightly different from the previous one in any case. So, uh, but we can discuss that later. Uh, we had a few conference uh, contributions. I list only the ones here that directly talk about uh, the work that we're doing on the software, there were more on uh, people using the software and, and uh, referring to us. It's one that mostly stir at the moment, obviously, although one, I think, serves as well. Um, we had a short course uh, organized by Harry with Johan and me as lecturers, and we had we were fortunate enough to have Ash, Nikos, and uh, Richard attending there to help with the SIR exercises. We didn't use SIRF there yet. The uh, reason was to keep it special for next year, in a way. That's what we're going to try and do. And uh, also, um, it's a pet and spec course, and so there is no spec in SIRF just yet. It wouldn't be hard to add, but it, it, 
we have enough to do so anyway. Uh, about 50 attendants there, and we were running the exercises via Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which you uh, we did talk about last time, I believe, either via virtual machine or in the cloud on Azure, and it was about half that people were using. So that, that went very well. There were no, no technical glitches this time around, I think. Uh, uh, people do uh, find the exercises good, and they usually ask for more time uh, on that. But you have only one day. Uh, you haven't received the official feedback uh, survey. Uh, we have organized a few seminars, or, or at least broadcasted them, not necessarily organized via the CCP. Uh, just draw your attention to one from Johan next week here at King's. Uh, which uh, will be online as well. Uh, it will be um, an entry on the website soon for that. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, we are all present in uh, lots of networks and so on. Uh, just brief update on data agreements with our manufacturers. So GE, nothing really has changed because they uh, agreed on everything on the pet side. Um, the text here on the Siemens slide is the same. I have had two weeks ago confirmation from uh, Björn Jacobi that they are willing to uh, distribute the information in the MRAC uh, at that time and the, uh, the hardware mu maps, uh, but they're getting the letter signed internally. So they will be doing that. So that's great should be able to handle the data completely independently from uh, from their software platform. It's taking a while, but it's getting good. Uh, so we had two exchanges, uh, one from Johannes Meyer on the numerical simulator, which you'll hear very briefly something about later on, and one from Ash Gilman, who was sort of a bit uh, optimistic on all the things he could do in six weeks, nevertheless. Uh, well, plus two weeks indeed. Uh, they were both very successful, I think. So just a reminder that, um, that we have plenty of money for more exchanges. So if you have somebody that you want to invite or somebody you want to send somewhere, uh, it's easy process so on the website. Okay, so um, those are most of the activities that we've done, uh, I think, in, since our last working group meeting. And uh, now we'll talk briefly about the progress since the software. So we're not going to give you a current status anymore because the, the, the status of the release is still the same as last time. Uh, but uh, we're going to give you some on what's happening and or what has already happened and is on the master. So this is for uh, Evgeny. Do I share? Well, I, I think I'll walk through it. Otherwise, we have to share Zoom or whatever. Uh, interest of time. All right. Okay. So a major recent development is the creation of a hierarchy of image data classes, uh, which is which provides necessary framework for uh, seamless conversion between PET and MR images. Uh, there are still issues to be resolved about uh, geometrical metadata, but um, uh, well, I believe we are making good progress. Um, um, thanks to uh, the work started at uh, Hackathon by uh, Ashley Gilman, uh, Johannes Meyer, and um, Richard Brown. Um, uh, this, is, um, this is actually a, a major step towards uh, a true synergy in, in our uh, um, framework because version 1.0 actually we didn't have any synergy. We could do either PET or MR, but not, no, no synergy between the two. And now we can, we're in a position to use um, MR images as anatomical trials. And, uh, and well, yeah, achieve through synergy. Um, and next um, significant development is, is um, our joint work with CCPI uh, team on um, unified framework a reconstruction framework, uh, which would cover not only PET and MR, but also CT and probably some other um, 
construction tools and modalities. Um, and it um, it is uh, it works in terms of abstract image and acquisition data objects and acquisition models and other stuff uh, which would facilitate uh, the use of um, optimization algorithm from core imaging library of CCPI and uh, hopefully some other uh, third party optimization tools. Uh, well, slightly less uh, stuff is uh, the uh, implementation of element wise multiplication and division on, on served data objects, uh, uh, which uh, uh, makes handling uh, uh, served data objects pretty much similar to handling uh, standard. Python or MATLAB arrays. Uh, we also introduced option of uh, project uh, of computing only a subset of forward projection and, and well, uh, uh, responding backward projection. Uh, well, well th this uh, provides uh, the user with the opportunity to develop their own reconstruction algorithm of ordered subset time. And uh, that's basically. Any any questions? From Does that mean for the first point we'd be able to do uh, pet reconstruction into MR voxel sizes? And uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm probably Richard is um, Well, I mean, I think in STIR you can sort of reconstruct. I mean, sometimes there's the problem in the Z direction, but I think in theory you can reconstruct to any voxel size you want. So you will be able to see that already. But I think this will really help you. If you already have some of our data, you can use that metadata. So you already know your voxel sizes. Um, uh, you should just be able to, you should be able to do your resampling. So really, I think this will really help you do your reconstruction with STIR and then whack it into an MR space. So I think it will just be in the resampling process. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, that's correct. <coughs> Stir has a limitation on Z voxel size because you sort of want to be aligned with your detector rings. But otherwise, there isn't any. So, my guess what you would want to do is resample your MR to the same space. Well, well, no, I was thinking the other way around. I mean, uh, one of my postdocs just recently published some nice results on reconstructing into the MR space. Yeah. Guys, we've lost you. Uh, okay. Oh, there's more coming here uh, at the bottom. Um, yeah, we added the, the parallel level sets. Uh, and that, um, that was down in 1.1. One one and it's, uh, it's not really new. All right. Okay. Good. Eduardo, do you want to say something? Um, yeah. So uh, in the hackathon, we decided to try to use the CIL algorithms for optimization, uh, which is a general platform for algorithms for optimization that we then use for CT normally. Uh, but because we do similar thing, uh, we, we have acquisition data, uh, image data, then we, we thought to, uh, at the stage of developing CCPI and library, we decided to adhere to the SURF uh, naming scheme. And then this was a, a great opportunity to try to merge the two libraries in one. This only affects Python at, at the minute, uh, but it also, uh, so we have, three uh, pull requests on the surf and surf super build uh, repository and a very lively uh, discussion especially on the on the first two uh, prs which i think it's um, uh, r rather interesting for for who is interested in mathematical things but uh, yeah it, it helped clean uh, our ideas in CCPI, but also in 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 surf. Um, then, uh, yeah, this is. Uh, other than that, I've started uh, updating the VM to a uh, more recent Ubuntu, which would 
uh, allow us to move to a more recent Gadgetron and uh, ISMR MRD. I managed to say it now. Um, I'm not sure. I think we had some glitches uh, there, uh, but I'm not sure uh, what's the problem. Uh, I I fully I'm fully aware of these problems of VGA, so the uh, virtual box. Um, oh, there there were other other things related to Ubuntu and Spider and stuff. So. Right. So yeah. So we have yeah. some problems related to the the base Ubuntu box. So maybe we would uh, I was considering to create an Ubuntu box from scratch rather than download the Ubuntu version. Uh, and then I, um, yeah, so I worked at the ACE package, which is required for building Gadgetron and not present in uh, other types of uh, Linux releases like uh, Red Hat. Uh, it's now actually working and I've created the Conda package in with the aim of uh, being able to distribute Surf as a Conda uh, package. Uh, now, actually, I'm. I got stuck recently this last week at building Gadgetron. There's some trouble, but yeah, I think it's proceed, proceeding well. I think we, I will have a problem splitting Stir and Surf because Surf needs some things f from the compilation or from the build of Stir, which it's not exported currently. So, I mean. We will have to discuss this, but that, that's that's my input. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, some some things from them. I don't know if you're online, but uh, we really have to hurry up. So, are you there, Ben? <coughs> uh, yes, I'm here. Just. Uh, just say a few words. Maybe. Sure. Okay. So yeah, um, basically, we were just able to deploy um, Stir and Surf uh, using Azure, Microsoft Azure, uh, and we've done that now both for the Hackathon, the PSMR, and um, the MIC. And so I've been using um, a technology called Terraform, which allows us to uh, describe all of the infrastructure in a text file, and um, and that can be. Uh, easily manipulated so that we can deploy new versions and uh, different variants and that kind of thing. And we're also able to use OpenMP, so if we want to, you can use very large machines on the on the cloud uh, to be able to demonstrate um, the uh, the capabilities for reconstruction. Of uh, uh, we've mainly done the PEP, but we could also do MR as well. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yep. So. Uh, I suppose the first one is, is well, really, I just want to get the, the code sort of integrated into the main branch of Surf as quickly as possible. And carrying on from what Evgeny was saying about the sort of the new structure of images, I need to make sure that all mine uh, complies with that. And that way, you know, it really helps with this idea of synergism, which is obviously what we're all about. Um, so that's where that one's up to. I also want to make it more generic so that we can use in the future potentially different registration packages. And then the bottom bit was just saying that uh, at the MIC, did some research on on the motion corrected uh, reconstructions in Stir, and so we'd really like to port that uh, those capabilities into Stir as well. So, yeah, I I just took one of your slides there from uh, the MIC uh, presentation just to <coughs> give an idea of the type. Of, so this was a um, head motion correction dynamic data finding motion from NAC images. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a few slides from other people as well. Uh, so Palek has been with other people, has been working hard on supporting GE data. Uh, so it's really, there's not too much uh, done there except maybe this block geometry, but if you can run it after the, uh, without that as well. So these are example images that she uh, had on her poster at the MIC with the G2 box and and uh, obviously, if you present it on a uh, on a projector, you can't see the difference. So that's good. <laughs> was sure good, no? She knew it. Uh, obviously, G can do um, resolution recovery, and 
doing that with block geometry would take a bit of work, I think. Um, since they can do Q clear, which we don't have, although it would be quite easy to add the derivative difference by G toolbox does look sharper there, though, to be fair. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, but in, interestingly, you see some, well, you, you see your the artifacts. Hoffman slices. Yeah, right. Right. So, uh, I mean, a lot of work from her, really, and not all of it scientific, so that's somewhat painful, but very good for all of us. Uh, so Johannes has been working on a simulation framework that I mentioned. Uh, it's uh, he previously de presented at developer meeting submitted by SMRM. So I'll just have two of his slides there. Not going to dwell on it, but uh, essentially he wants to do kinetics, respiratory, and cardiac motion. And uh, this is uh, an example where he uses uh, MR at the moment. It's concentrating on MR, but that side should follow. Uh, so these are not simulations, but the out reconstructed images with surf from the simulations with surf. Yes, so uh, that's, uh, that will be very powerful, really, once, once we have that in. Uh, it's been working hard at that stuff, following up from the exchange. And then a few things uh, that are coming quite soon. So time of flight is, is really getting ready now from Nikos. Um, so Ash has been working on the multiple position and LPS coordinates, and there's a few minor minor things to add up there, but uh, I think yeah, that should be there soon. Uh, and Daniel has contributed this HKEM hybrid kernel expectation maximization into STIR, and then porting that to serve will sort of be uh, two hours work for everything. Um, and Ash has helped him with that. <coughs> and then I mentioned rock detectors already. That's work in Zurich. Uh, they, they have clinical, sorry, uh, preclinical scanner development. So they wanted to have rock detectors. And she has, I think, now submitted a paper on that. And so we'll see that software soon as well. And then once we have that, we can use it for other clinical scanners as well. Uh, right. So that's sort of our progress, and because there has been a lot of progress, I thought it uh, would be good to have another round of uh, CCP PETAMAR awards, um, which we try and award roughly annually to the top three contributors. Uh, sadly, only early career researchers. So most of the people are around the room, so <laughs> not, not, not <laughs> eligible. <laughs> um, and that can be for contributions in software education or administrative matters. <coughs> and, uh, so just a reminder that the last year we had Christoph and Casper uh, getting the prize. And so the, we had some discussion on who should be getting the prizes uh, this year. And uh, maybe the discussion was very limited because I didn't give people too much time. But uh, we thought it would be good to uh, award prizes for stuff that has already made it or for active contributions as opposed to things that are on, on the horizon uh, because that gives people motivation to finish that, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, oh, oh, that's interesting animation. So the question is, <laughs> so we thought to uh, uh, Ash Gold, although his contributions are not quite finished yet, but he, he's been very active uh, on, on the on GitHub and so on, and helping people out. So that is uh, quite important. Uh, silver to Ben for uh, training via cloud computing and all the uh, provisioning stuff that I still have to get my head around. And uh, bronze to Casper again for all his work on uh, Docker and Conda and general troubleshooting with Git continuous integration. If we have if we have a question on that, he's always there. And then I thought it would be quite useful to say that uh, really the work from Richard, Evgeny, and Eduardo is very very appreciated, but we can't give you any awards. <laughs> so uh, a big congratulations. Damn. To, uh,
course. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, back to the so, uh, uh, yeah. As, I, as I've said, there is, there is uh, a lot of contenders for the prizes for next time, right? So, that's good. Uh, right. So, we'll, we'll try and get something with Skype, whatever, because two of those people are actually in Australia, and so we couldn't really ask them to wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, I'll put something on the website. Okay, so that's a overview of our past activities. I, I know I'm rushing a bit, but time is moving very fast. Uh, so I thought it would be useful a suggestion from Harry actually to have a look at our deliverables that we promised during the grant proposal. And what I've done put in red are the things that uh, we have to work on. Uh, so a lot of the uh, networking targets that we set ourselves have been easily reached. I think it didn't really quite count, but uh, there's no doubt that we've done all of that, but it's, it's in black already. Uh, we still have 60 months left. However, uh, the two things that are missing there are uh, the data sets, both phantom and patient data sets, and then also uh, our uh, outreach activities, which we really haven't done a lot. So that we need to try and address over the coming year to make sure that we uh, deliver on all our uh, targets. So on the software side, uh, most of it is is chugging along. If you, uh, I, I'd say, I don't really do 4D PET and so on, but that's coming very quickly. Um, we did mention GPU versions, which we had a discussion on in previous software meeting and got sort of slightly discouraged about trying to make a GPU, serve GPU platform, because it would be very hard to get Gadgetron and Stir and, and Nifty Ritual, uh, sort of how do they talk together on the GPU side. So our feeling was that we try and leave the GPU side to each platform, and then we have some overhead in calling things from Serve. Uh, and that, does an employee that we put uh, put some effort in into porting uh, one of the existing GPU efforts on the pet side to serve or uh, include it as a uh, sort of extra engine. So something that we need to think about as well. And then another item is pre-compiled libraries and whatever, which I think. Some of it we could do, although I'm sure it would be very painful once we actually try it out. Uh, so overall, I think we're doing okay for 60 months going. But, uh, any comments on that? No? So, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I can add that may, uh, later we'll talk about the user survey, which may give guidance also with respect to this red things. Actually, now. Ah, which is now. So, uh, really, uh, we, we're uh, well, very, very late. Uh, we sort of have seven minutes in principle to try and cover this. Okay. Uh, okay. I think I'll have to stop sharing. Yeah, but I'm the boss, so I can stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I can do it. Okay. See my screen? Yes. Okay. Let's see if I click here, what happens? So you see, we've run the user survey uh, back in October, I think. Uh, so the aim was, uh, we, we've written this sentence. So we are putting a lot of effort into supporting multiple OSs. However, this is slowing down our progress and we would like to ask our potential user base on which system they are thinking to install and use our software. So basically, uh, so the results, so we made a lot of questions, but I think I, I'm, I'm trying to present what is the most, uh, uh, the results of uh, that came out clearly. So, first of all, what operating system would our uh, user install Surf onto? Now, um, you see, people who clicked Linux or Windows or Mac OS 
uh, they're piled up. So 20, we have the majority of people w wanting the, system, the surf to be running on on Linux. And if you break down all these counts, it means, uh, so the blue thing would be people who have selected Linux only. And, and then the, the, the red would be people who have selected the Windows and Linux. And the gray, it's Mac and Linux. And the other one is all three together. So I would say that there is a clear interest of, of people. So if, if you see the, the Windows one, it's mostly people wanting at least another another operating system with Linux inside uh, and Windows. While in the Linux uh, box, you have mostly in people interested in just Linux. So my take on this result is that uh, people are interested in having a, the, the software running on Linux rather than on other platforms. Um, additionally, we had asked people what was the uh, preferred way to distribute the software. And basically the answer is we want um, a, a way to distribute these things, which is native to the operating system you install it to. So if you are on Windows, you, would, you just want to double click on an icon and have your software installed. If you are on, on Linux, it would be great to have um, either the binaries or, or Debian packages or RPMs, or whatever, or Conda. But anyway, so this is kind of the idea. So my take is I think we can do, we can kind of drop other operating system with and keep Linux if this is slowing down our progress. Uh, we asked also about the language bindings uh, people would be interested in. And I think uh, it came out that uh, we didn't think about C++ API, right? At the beginning, we, we thought we wanted Python or MATLAB. Uh, my take on these results is that uh, people are interested in everything. So they, they are interested in both Python and MATLAB. And they, it's, there is a, a consistent group who wants something for C++ as well. So this means that we are doing good. We are supporting uh, the community for what they want. They want Python and MATLAB, and probably we, we will need to clean the C++ if, or, or not, or document it a little bit more. Uh, lastly, I think, um, we asked about the parallelism, uh, which people would wish to uh, exploit. And in this case, uh, uh, we have uh, multi-threading CPU or GPU or MPI or more than two. So my take on this is that people are interested in mostly having a multi-threading CPU but also GPU, because GPU is kind of a, you know, this buzzword. So if you say GPU, it means that it runs fast. I'm, I'm not sure we've come to a decision whether we want, oh, well, well, Chris already just mentioned that maybe we just let GPU thing be running on the engines rather than on surf. At any rate, I think this, this graph shows, uh, this result, this, yeah, shows you that people are more interested in, in multi-threading rather than GPUs. And another question I'm not showing was about the, the type of a target machine that we're thinking to install the software, which means, uh, and we, we asked whether a laptop or a desktop or a high-end high -end workstation or a cluster, and then I think people uh, want it all. They, they want to be able to install it on a laptop and a high-end workstation. Clusters seem to be a little more uh, a niche thing, which also explains why MPI is uh, low here. So all in all, I think the result of the, of the survey tell us that we can kind of drop Windows and Mac OS in, you know, in our development at the minute and we 
go on like we are doing. Thank you, Adobe. So any any comments on this survey achieved its purpose? <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I it's Julian here, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm going to just make one point. There's a danger that we of, of circularity here in that we get responses that reflect what we're providing rather than what people actually desire because we build up a community of um, you know, people who can use the functionality that we provide. So we should be a little cautious in interpreting um, the results such as people not, don't want it for Windows. I suspect they probably do want it for Windows, but we've had difficulties getting it, getting everything running for Windows. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. So can, can you remind me how many people actually answered that one? Uh, 37, 37. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good, actually. I think that's more, more than just the people actually working on it at the moment. Julian, I can just comment a little on the Windows thing. Windows came, came. Uh, people want want something with Windows, but if you if you are looking at how many people just asked for Windows, it's just five. And the, these people who, the total number of people who want something on Windows, they they kind of say, well, I want Windows and Linux or Windows and Mac or the three. So while when you go to uh, Linux, you have a lot of people just say, I don't, I'm not interested in other things rather than Linux. So that's, that's the type of feeling I got. That's why I say maybe we can drop it for the time being. Of, yeah. I think the priority clearly should be for, for Linux. I think that's, that's, that, that's clear. Um, but there are lots of Windows users out there that don't use don't use Linux. Um, so we need to be cautious that we're not we're not excluding that indefinitely. No, sure. And actually, uh, we had a brief discussion on the VM uh, repository about opening ports from the VM, so that eventually you can actually use these Jupyter notebooks, for instance, from the host, which could be anything. Uh, and have the system being uh, installed on a virtual machine with Linux without, say, too much of uh, overhead with X servers and stuff like that. I'm not sure how it works with MATLAB and uh, it doesn't. a Gadgetron, yeah. Gadgetron, it's okay. Uh, up, but, um, I don't know, do, do King's people, do, do you, what's your feeling about this? Because, uh, are, you, are you doing all your work on Linux or Windows or whatever? Both. I mean, both, yeah. For Linux. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole thing works on Windows. That is not really the problem, yes. Uh, if, aside from Gadgetron, so you need to run Gadgetron somewhere else, uh, which we can do via the virtual machine. So that just makes life much harder, but it can be done. Uh, but the question is maybe, well, going towards packaging Windows and, and all of that, that is quite a lot of work. Uh, so presumably we we can say let's uh, deprioritize that because it doesn't have that yet already. And I would still I would still try and do it uh, for sure because it might enhance our uh, user audience, but I would do it at low priority. I see some moving around the room. Uh, Mac is maybe uh, I was a bit surprised by that. Uh, lower numbers there. It's also probably less effort to maintain, obviously. Than we have I don't been. know. I think no? Pretty much all of the conflict problems and whatever we have, they're always Mac.
So I, I guess it's sort of the same, the same thing really as, as the Windows side that obviously some of our development that is working uh, is happening on Mac. So <coughs> we're not going to drop it, but possibly better to, to say on the website, well, they really recommend you to use Linux for the moment. Uh, the other stuff might work. Um, thank you. So uh, this might be, thanks Eduardo, might, yep. might be going to uh, check who's online at the moment. So I'll try and get this up here. Uh, we've heard then already. Um, so I see uh, Jeff Fessler, Julian, Martin Brin. And we'll will halot there. So I guess that means that Alex is not yet on. Um, so that gives us the opportunity to just discuss a little bit longer. Um, uh -oh. uh, can somebody send the new Zoom link to Alex? He might not have been on the mailing list. So, did you do it? No. No. Okay. I, thought you were, I thought you were doing it right I now. Do it. Okay. Otherwise. Okay. okay. So in the meantime, I'll just uh, continue a little bit. So um, these are largely slides from last time. With that. So I think we have had most of discussion already. Uh, just to mention that we're aiming for a, a new release early uh, next year. Uh, we had some discussion on this just to just to mention that we need to move to uh, Ubuntu 18.04 as Gordon already said and these things I think we discussed so I'll, uh, uh, yeah can I say I think so with regards to the operating system and after so Linux distribution would be the preferred is without uh, doubt Ubuntu Although we want to do it on Red Hat, or I want. Yeah. No, uh, on Scientific Linux, yeah. Yeah, Scientific, yeah. Uh, again, so th this is sort of a, a side effort, I think, but um, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be a major thing aside from packages, as you know. Uh, so Python, I think uh, we should be dropping version two really accept that it's going to move more work to drop it at the moment than to support it. <laughs> so that's why I put it at quarter two. Uh, when when we, we slowly move on things, we make sure that everything is using Python 3 and then we, we drop Python 2, I would say. Uh, MATLAB version, I don't really have a lot of experience with that at all on how backwards compatible things are and so on. Uh, so we'll have to find out once people are starting to use MATLAB more. I haven't had a lot of uh, comments on that yet on the mailing list. Okay, so very briefly on the phantom side, um, just put up the slide from last time from Julian. Uh, I, so not much has happened here. Unfortunately, um, I, I don't know, Julian, do you want to say a word or two? You don't have to. Sorry, Chris, I popped out for literally about two, two minutes and I've just, just rushed back into the room. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I just heard you say my name. But <laughs> That's for two minutes. Yeah, just, just to say <laughs> if, you, if you want to say uh, two words on the Phantom Working Party or, or not at all. Well, there's very little to, to, to report because there's the lack of progress so that comes down to the fact I've been uh, too busy in the last few months to, 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 to push this. Yeah. Um, did we find somebody to assist me in driving this forward? Because that's one of the things we were trying to do. Yeah. 
So uh, this is it's really a cry for help. This one we do we do need somebody to to help with this. I I personally think this is actually quite important uh, part of the project uh, to have that data there to standardize it and to uh, then provide scripts and whatever to reconstruct it. I think that we're all um, a problem of time. I don't think it's a major effort, but it's an important one. Um, yeah. I've contacted NPL people, but haven't had a reply yet. I did it too late, so my apologies. Uh, I, I asked Ben to sort of make a list of the phantom data that we have, but I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll have to skip it. Sorry, Ben. Uh, there isn't too much out there at the moment. Um, the, uh, so the, there are some spatial calibrations and some cylinder NEMA, whatever, but so this, this is not, we don't have a, a nice list all, all uh, curated and whatever. So that's something that needs to happen. Uh, so um, Pavel is making some progress on collecting data as part of the harmonization grant that I'm involved in now. The, the caveat is that obviously Pavel needs to be given the first opportunity to use that data. But once he's finished with it, I would imagine that that will become, you know, that would be possible to share that, that, that data. Oh yeah, great. Obviously, we'd have to ask Pavel and make sure that everybody involved is happy. But um, you know, they're, 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 we should be able to do, do do some things. But we were aiming to be a bit more ambitious, where we were trying to get people to devise particular data sets for um, PET MR, and I think that's a bit more tricky. Um, and we haven't we haven't succeeded in doing that, despite some interesting ideas. <coughs> Any comments from anybody else? Uh, all right. Um, so, yes, feel free to volunteer. Um, patient data. So I, I put that one on the agenda. Uh, really not more as, as also a discussion point on what we can do there. And what should we be doing, and then how we do it? Uh, at least one, one small part of that discussion today. Um, so, originally in the grant proposal, we thought it would be useful to have a small database uh, with patient data as a testing ground, if you like, for for, for algorithms. Uh, now, the, we don't really say in there if that we will hold the database, whatever. It could just be providing pointers to stuff that is already out there. So that's why I say access to or interface to. Uh, if, if there are other initiatives, and there are, that are acquiring all raw data and making it available, then we should just be able to provide pointers. Uh, and, and then, ideally, associated scripts that then say, well, this is how you get that data, and that is then how you get your first reconstruction code, so that you can then fiddle around with it. Uh, I think this should be achievable as opposed to us creating an XNAT server, whatever, which we're never going to do. Uh, uh, right, so I think that data would be mostly useful if we have sort of ancillary data associated to it, so that you can at least do some kind of evaluation of all of them. I mean, otherwise, we reconstruct an image and say, yeah, looks nice. Uh, so if we if it would be data where there is a clinical question where we know the answer for that would be wonderful uh, and uh, that obviously is always very hard to get but we are, we're all struggling with these questions in our research all the time so if you know about data that is publicly available or can be made publicly available then I think we might be able to centralize information in a way that might be good um, so, obviously, I, I, yeah, I think first point I already mentioned, uh, we don't have a database infrastructure, so uh, I mentioned that one already. And then there are many issues around ethics, uh, GDPR and patient consent, and I, uh, to
to, to kick this off, I thought uh, it's really the, the last point that we wanted to have some discussion on uh, today as opposed to the other things. Uh, it is, uh, if we don't have ethics and consent sorted out, then we can't do the rest really. Now, obviously, if we rely on existing initiatives, they might have all of that sorted and we just tag along, uh, but nevertheless, good to have more information. And so I, I did a little bit of, of reading myself, but really I don't, I don't know enough about these things. Uh, so I have some links here. Um, so from the uh, MRC uh, lecture notes, if you like, uh, they say, if you have robustly anonymized data, you don't require a concept, which I didn't know. Uh, I think it's true, but I think in practice we do, because you have to take, you have to do the anonymization, so you need access to the data. But fair, fair processing, as it would be called it. Yes. And there's always a risk of re-identification, so, which I think it would be fair to make plain to people. Yeah. And I think we need to be aware that the regulations have changed with GDPR, where um, pseudo anonymization is not sufficient. No, sure. Uh, so, I mean, that's on my next slide. But um, so this this is. I'm assuming they have updated their guidelines. I don't really know, but if that's they, true. Yeah, that's they do say if you did anonymize, not pseudo anonymize, but if you did anonymize, then you don't need consent, presumably, to distribute it. That's my interpretation. That's true. Well, but the, the problem is that. I mean, like we have hospitals selling data to Google, don't we? It's difficult to protect against future re-identifications. Sure. I think you have to be, I think, I think you're on much safer ground if the participants have explicitly consented for their data to be anonymized and shared. And that, that's really where you end up in, in, in difficulty. If you go and do stuff with, with, with data where that, ha that hasn't been uh, explicit, I think you can end up in, um, in, in very awkward situations. So in particular, the process of anonymization, you probably need, con you need consent for. So the gist of it is you go to hospital, you have a scan, you don't, you reasonably expect doctors to look at it, but you don't reasonably expect somebody to kind of steal it and then anonymize it. Yeah. That's it's that process that, yeah. that probably needs the consent law. <clears throat> Okay. Um. It depends on the ethics, no? And some ethics may be amended. Yeah. But the thing is, if, if we want to go into that, um, so I think our ethics, they will say that they can be reused for research, but not specifically that they can be shared. But you could amend an, an ethics and add the sharing part, but you will have to do it. Sure, yeah. I mean, that, that's. That's clear, but so the, I mean, the surprising thing for, on, the, on that statement for me was that they seem to say, well, then you don't need ethics. No, you don't need to, to, if the data is anonymized, you don't need ethics to share it, but you need ethics to anonymize that data, to use it, basically. I think, I think where, where, where this comes from is when you've created data sets that have been designed to be shared across the research community, but if you're just accessing that data to, to answer a scientific question, you do not need ethics for, for that purpose. But then the people who <coughs> has gone into that, they would have explicitly consented to have their data, you know, anonymized to put in that in that in that database. Uh, it's clearly the safer option. Sure. I, I have to leave. I don't know, David, if you mentioned already that there is a big data set of raw data, but only for a month. I was going to say that. Yeah, I don't know what Chris has got. Yeah, I, I just had one, uh, just a slide on other initiatives and then one on the pseudonymization. Thank you, Claudia. So, uh, so before, maybe let's discuss that first and then go back to the existing data sets, if you don't mind. Uh, so just mentioned that uh, there is a, a, a big initiative at SDFC, but they really thought only about physical sciences. Uh, but when we talked about it at the CCP steering panel meeting, they were interested in looking at human data. Uh, 
that they don't really, it's not their cattle or fish, if you like. Uh, and then the MRC is set up the Health Research Data Institute, and uh, that will be talking about all of these things all the time. And the, their website seems to be a bit weird in the sense that it's all saying it is happening, but then it's happening since 19. 17, sorry, 2000. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe their website is out of it. But that's, uh, so the MRC representative at the CCP steering panel said that it, I needed to have a look at that, but then the website hardly gives any information. Uh, but it's a huge thing, yes. Uh, so, yeah. And then, hey, as Martin, can I comment on the, the first point? Sure. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so STFC has got this this project with Southampton to build up the physical sciences database. But the point is that the funding is coming from EPSRC. So the what would need to be done, I think, is to convince EPSRC that it was a yeah uh, an application of physical sciences to healthcare uh, along the TTL kind of argument. So yeah, it's just that first point. It's the the condition is coming from EPSRC, not from SDFC. Right. Uh, but, sorry, but did you mean with TTL? Uh, there's there's um, technology touching life. I mean, I, I just use that as an example. There are cases where EPSRC funding is applied to healthcare, so it's not well, impossible. CCP is that? <laughs> is that weird oh yes, for example, yes. <laughs> So, so it's not impossible, but I, I think it would, yeah, it's not a case of convincing SDFC. I think it would be a case of maybe checking the scope against the, the fund, EPSRC as the funders. Right. I don't know whether the TTL, the, the Imaging Bio O a UCL just set up. I don't see, that's so used different modalities for 4D imaging, biological imaging. I'm not sure that has a, any data streams, but there are other TTLs, you say. Well, I mean, T TTL is an overarching um, yeah. program strategy. Um, I'm just trying to work out a friendly one we know of. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, our, our aim would be slightly different than the usual health aim where you say, I want to study the disease, and in <coughs> case you want to study get that result. So it's, that's why we have EPSRC funded. But yeah, there's a fine line, obviously. Right, so I just had something on anonymization. Um, so pre-GDPR, I think we were sort of okay, but since <coughs> GDPR, uh, as, as Julian already mentioned, uh, even if you pseudo-anonymize, like I guess oh, uh, you still have to consider uh, GDPR, and so uh, it's sort of it's, it seems very hard to actually anonymize because uh, it, it previous interpretation was that uh, once the separation has been made, as I said there, the, the original data controller might. Have identical part and identifiable data, but as long as the people at the other side of the fence don't see that, everything is fine. So now they say, no, that's not good enough because you can re-identify in some fashion anyway. So how you really anonymize medical data, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think. I think my, my view, Chris, is that it's actually impossible to anonymize medical image data because there will be some record somewhere that enables you to, to relink that data. And that's almost required for ethical reasons. If you had an incidental finding, you would need to be able to, to, to identify that individual and um, inform the, 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 the participant or the participant's GP. But what's meant by pseudo anonymization, I think, is you know, if, if, you know, unless they were, they had privileged information, they wouldn't be able to identify somebody that may be sufficient, but I think it's a gray area. Yeah, it, it seems, uh, it seems a bit murky. Yes. So, yeah, 
I think it'll be very hard to make a claim that we really anonymize things 100%. If we do it, we would have to, all dates and whatever would have to be gone, which is not so easy to then get your quantification right. All dates, all links, IDs, um, even, you know, information about sites and other things that together could be, could be seen to potentially identify an individual. So, looking at, so at the moment we've got UK Biobank and Dementia's Platform UK in Britain, I think, giving out image data. Both require manual, applicants to apply manually and then that's vetted. Sorry, to apply and then it's vetted manually. But then they're both giving out clinical information, essentially. Yeah, but I imagine that they would explicitly consent for their data to be used for that purpose. Yeah. Um, and then in, there's this recently a fastmri.org website, just to come online from New York, where they've made available raw MR raw data in ISM or MRD format and DICOMs, and it's all knees. Uh, so it's sort of difficult to re-identify visually. Um, but they seem to only ac they seem to accept an automatic sat well you have to read a data sharing agreement enter your email address press agree and then you get a link sent to you so then don't appear to be manually vetting applicants. <coughs> right. um, but they're more of an engineering they're more like us in the sense that it's an engineering application rather than a, a medicine one if you like um, and then the cancer research uk have Going to fund this national clinical something. Got, oh, sorry, it's called NCT. I can't remember what all the letters stand for now. And Simon Doran at Institute of Cancer Research is, I think, tasked with the data sharing, at least amongst the seven sites. Um, so that hasn't actually started yet. The funding is only just about to be announced. Um, but he's, his view is also that you can't. You, you can't really go down this, it's all anonymous route. You've got, to, you've got to treat it as it does need proper content. Yeah. Um, so, my feeling was that <coughs> unless we were just going to point to other websites and things, we have to decide first on the mechanism for release whether it's by a vetted, whether it's people applying and we vet it manually, or whether it's kind of automated. Or whether it's something in between, because that in, that kind of informs. Because we then have to get permission, presumably, of the data owners. Draw up a data sharing agreement between the owners and anybody we give it to them. So they would want to know how it's going to be released. And um, I'm not sure about that. I was kind of intrigued by. It. I don't know if you listened to Click on BBC. They have a Facebook page, and people have to answer questions to join their group which is manually um, checked by the presenter. So that might be some kind of halfway house between having some big <laughs> betting committee versus <laughs> um, you also, if, you, if you have some script to release data, you've got to worry about robots and capture and all that business. Yeah. Uh, so, who David, <laughs> just, just yeah? what you said, I think there's two separate things. One is obviously the ethical aspects ensuring appropriate consent and um, permissions to... Well, I think um, we're agreed on that. I think we need that. So. Yeah, and then the second thing is the, who owns the data and ensuring that the person who transfers the data is entitled to, 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 to transfer the data because they are the, the, the owner. And the ownership of, of, of medical data often, I think, is very opaque. Is it the scanning site? Is it the... Um, the, the 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 researchers doing the doing the research or is it the funding body and i think that comes down to the contract agreements between um those various organizations um, um which may be explicit in which case it's clear but often is not yeah yeah i, I agree it's uh 
we don't box or no. <laughs> really. In some cases we do. Uh, if we were going to make something available, we'd have to find out who that was and then tell them or discuss with them how we were proposing to release the data, wouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, I think if you have a I think if you have a um a research protocol where it's explicit that this is what you intend to do with the data. I think you're on relatively safe grounds because you're only doing something within the, the, the stated remit of, 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 that, of that study. Um, outside of that, I think you're on more dodgy grounds where you do need to go and get explicit, um, um, you, know, um, you know, consent from the owner that this is an acceptable thing to do, whoever that owner is. Sorry, Julian, uh, one second. So uh, there is a phone number that he can dial. Yeah, I'm phoning. I've put him on loudspeaker maybe right. from my mobile, see if that works. <laughs> Hello, Alexander. Hi, it's Andrew. I can put you on loudspeaker to join if that helps. It can't be worse, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, did he, he, well, it's maybe too late, but is there a um, proof oh, to his email now? Uh, right. Uh, I, there is a phone number that he could use. Yeah. Alex, can you hear us or is, it, is this hopeless? There's a lot of noise. I think Chris is trying to speak with me. But, uh, he is trying to speak with you, yes. Um, if I I send you a, a number recently, this number should work, yes, Eduardo? Oh. Uh, oh. Hello, yeah, I think. Yeah, then you got to the meeting number. Yeah. Depending where you are, you may, there might be a different. Mm. Well, it's UK. No, it's, it's yeah, UK one should work, and then you just got to put the right meeting number in, not the code, not the old code. And uh, the pound is the hash. So yeah, if you look at the Zoom, only takes care of the screen sharing, and uh, one has to dial it in. Yeah. Uh, yep. Just, you can call in, Alex, uh, but I'm trying to get you the, the meeting number. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to get that. I'll put it on the other one. No, the meeting number is different, no? Yeah, the meeting number is that. Oh, it's just a whole other website. 753? Yeah, that's it. 2174422. That's it. And when they say hash, uh, pound, they mean hash. Yes. Well, looks like one. <coughs> Without the curly bits. <laughs> What's this? Right. Send you send you a number which you might try. I think he's trying it. I can hear him on the phone. Okay. There wasn't enough numbers. It doesn't exist. It's a meeting right. There wasn't enough numbers. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Like progress. Hi there. I'll okay, time. we'll hang up on the phone, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I guess that m means you haven't really heard anything of what we're saying, Alex. Um, that's correct. I, uh, you know, it looked like a site that does uh, audio and video. So yeah. I didn't realize you do both. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no, it should do both. But anyway, 
Um, so, okay, so I think uh, if I try and summarize the discussion up to now, so our feeling is that with GDPR, uh, we are stuck with pseudo anonymization and therefore uh, GDPR rules apply. And uh, that means uh, we need to get for any patient data we would want to distribute, we need to have consent and ethics to be able to share the data uh, uh, with other people, uh, which might not necessarily be easy if you yes. don't know. Can, the I, can I interrupt? There's the fact, <laughs> the fact whether something <laughs> a DPR applies is independent of the ethical considerations. Sure. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and consent. There's only one legal, I mean, the, there's one legal basis for <coughs> consent, which is probably not what most sites operate under. They probably have a different stated uh, legal basis. So the two should be confused. That, that, in my view, that's completely separate. Uh, correct. Sorry. Um, so, uh, well, yeah. I, I guess, it, although we, we can think about tools for randomization and so on, which is an, an, an initiative that maybe you want to talk about, uh, Alexander, but uh, it might not be sufficient to be able to make all of this very easy. <laughs> uh, but um, I think there are a few new uh, elements, you know, where, um, as Julian hinted, uh, what GDPR makes easier is uh, your legal basis is no longer uh, consent, but the public interest. Yeah, so uh, the, the legal basis is relatively easy. As you said, it's always um, easiest if um, you've got informed consent. And I think that most ethics committees probably wouldn't object to you making uh, pseudo-anonymized pseudo data uh, available as long as you explain that in your patient information sheet and get the consent for it. And there the devil is in the detail. For example, uh, in, in a recent study, in a pre-GDPR study, we thought we had that. But if you read it again, not with the mind of somebody who knows what they want to do, but with the mind of somebody who tries to put obstacles in the way of what you want to do, uh, then you could, in, on a couple of occasions, you could argue that it wasn't uh, unequivocal. But if, you know, for anything going forward, if, if you do and, uh, put it in your patient information sheet and your um, uh, consent form that you are going to share the data, then you can definitely uh, do that. Another option may be uh, regarding the slide that is uh, currently on there. Um, if you do the... And if you do a pseudo anonymization and lose the key, then you can talk about anonymized data. So, and in many instances, that will be enough. You know, if, if you've got a case series of uh, a, a dozen patients and everybody is, uh, uh, you, you know, say there are only two women and only one of them is uh, uh, over 60, then if you put in your, the data set you share and link to the original paper um, who the woman uh, of over 60 is, then of course you could identify them. But if, if you use appropriate safeguards uh, and say, you know, male 10 to 20 and there is a sufficient number, then even the controller couldn't get back to the original data in an unequivocal way. And my understanding is that that data is then considered anonymized and therefore no longer under GDPR. And then you can make it uh, very easily um, available. In fact, I'm in discussions uh, when I couldn't get any further with the informed consent. I'm in discussions with the trust R&D department about doing exactly that, you know, taking the entire data set, really anonymizing it so that even we couldn't go back in the, you know, administrator sense. Of course, you could uh, devise a machine learning algorithm to identify uh, the data in some other way. 
and we all know that uh, true anonymization doesn't exist. Um, but uh, for GDPR purposes, I think it can probably be done. And then you can share your databases even uh, uh, on, on web pages where people can download them. Yeah, uh, it, would, it would be fantastic if uh, you would be able to push that through with your, with your trust and then share the relevant information with other people. Because I, I think it's going to be hard because with Im imaging data, you know, the, presumably the data will always sit on the NHS site as well. And it, it's not very hard to write an algorithm that compares images uh, or, or raw data. So uh, or e even if all the administrative information is common, it, it's different from in a paper where you, you give a result, the SUV is seven, uh, that's easily done the identifiable but the actual image itself seems to be very hard but so alex before you came on we were discussing who owns the data um do you have that clear here at st thomas's alex so david david is asking if it uh, is ownership for the for the clinical data at St. Thomas always clear cut or are there uh, instances where it's not clear if this is NHS or, or Kings or the or the PI or or the funder or whatever? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear the question at all. Um, in principle, it should be very clear. But, uh, you know, when, when it's acquired just for research and under research protocol, then it should be KCL. And for healthy volunteers, GSTT accepts that. If the patients are recruited from G GSTT, uh, there are discussions ongoing because GSTT argues that we couldn't have recruited them if GSTT hadn't done all the work uh before that so that is a little bit gray the other area where it's gray is for example in my pet ct to pet mr comparison the pet mr is acquired only for research but of course the only value for the comparison is if you can compare it to the pet ct which was acquired clinically but also by virtue of being under the ethical protocol also becomes research data so you can have data with two labels and uh, that is an area of, um, of active discussion. But my understanding is for your purposes, that doesn't matter because you're only talking about pure research data, right? Well, it's definitely easier to, to do this with pure research data, yes. I think if we, we already have, local, each of us has diff, local difficulties in uh, using normal uh, NHS data for, for the research. So that's just uh, asking for too much. In, in the current context, sure. But, but uh, actually, that's an important point because earlier you said that uh, you can't really ultimately anonymize an image. Uh, that, that may be true, but for example, with, with the Hammers atlases, which we made available, um, it, even pre GDPR, when it was difficult to send stuff to the US, we just cut the face area off, you know, in a way that wouldn't affect. Uh, um, automatic algorithms and then you can't identify them from the face because the data is simply no longer there I yeah. agree that if you uh, if you do a rigid registration and do uh, 500 uh, subtraction images you will eventually find the image but for that you would need access to both the research database and the NHS database and that's of course not going to happen so you know it comes back to the, the concept of criminal energy needed. We, we all know that uh, proper privacy doesn't exist anymore anyway. It's just about how much effort you go to and what databases you would need to have access to. And I think, you know, people like NHS trusts and regulators and ethics committees and, and us need to strike some, some balance there. Yeah, uh, I think the Unfortunately, because we are an image reconstruction project, the, the cutting of the face strategy won't work because you would 
have to do it in the real data, which is impossible. Uh, what, what about um, scrambling the face surface data? So you only lose a few vo voxels, uh, but enough to no longer uh, make the face recognizable. But you know, ma maybe only losing 50 milliliters out of uh, maybe two or three liters of head. No, we, we, we can't do it because we would be distributing list mode data and all of that stuff, so. Ah, okay. Uh, so we're, we're a bit stuck there, I think. Uh, so our challenge is harder than any others. Are, maybe, are, are you aware of people actually already distributing raw data? Uh, as in list mode data? Yeah. No. I am aware of several initiatives, though, to, um, uh, to, to, to work on face data. I am still of the opinion that it's really hard to identify people based on uh, an MR reconstructed face because you're missing all the hair. Um, but uh, people with better face recognition abilities may not find it as hard as I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that 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 won't that won't work for us. I don't think so. But are you? I mean, you, in the reconstruction world, are you aware of any initiatives where uh, really raw data is shared? Uh, well, I, I believe the only one that I know of is uh, at least plant is DPUK, but I might be wrong. And I presume you're talking about um, sinograms and case bases, because you know, from a, from a reconstructed PET image, I would challenge anybody to recognize the face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. Yes. Oh, oh, and case space. Yes. Sure. And can you, with case space, can't you? Uh, isn't there a trick you could do uh, by, by losing um, the, the outer parts of case space so you can't recognize the finer detail, i.e. you would have a coarse face, but I guess, you know, if you, if you only have the coarse features of the MR, you might as well stick with PET. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the answer will be GANs, effectively. We just uh, create artificial, very realistic data. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a possibility. <clears throat> yeah, but it's a research project. Yeah. Uh, I think interesting that you mentioned that there is an initiative in Portugal to um, give you simulated data, sim set or whatever, not MR, but. Uh, to do something like that. Uh, right. Uh, okay. Uh, my my feeling is that uh, we seem to come to the conclusion that we are in the pseudo anonymization world where everything might be re identifiable and therefore we would have to ask for uh, advice, uh, more advice than uh, what we have at the moment on how this can be done, if at all. Uh, so just just to maybe finish off, uh, I think the role of our group is probably to ask people questions and to find out how do other people handle this and then sort of could at the minimum, try and give some guidelines on this is how you do this. That I think already would be useful. So it's obviously hard to make a claim on guidelines if you're not 100% sure. <laughs> um, what you theory. might consider is um, uh, getting an MR of, say, yourself or something, um, uh, 3D reconstruct that and 
put an, an image like that into the patient information sheet um, where, where patients you know, could either consent to um, all of their data being available or all of the data uh, to, to the research group or all of the data to everybody and you could say uh, look, th this is the um, this is the, the level of detail you, you get with these reconstructions, and of course nobody would know that you had participated in this uh, uh, study. So they would need to identify you out of uh, everybody in in London or the uh, UK. That is, I, I think that would probably be acceptable to any ethics committee as really informed consent when people see what they're letting themselves in for. That's, that's a good idea, I think. And if, we've, uh, if we've got money to pay for phantom acquisitions, then could we consider setting up a small study where we actually scanned healthy volunteers like ourselves? Well, we, we could. Uh, I, 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 I think the, the, the practical logistics in doing that are quite um, extensive. So, you know, do we need ethics permission to do that? Almost certainly. Unless there's an existing ethics, that means that you got to go through all the bureaucracy of getting all the permissions, etc., which is a lot of work. Yeah, I, I think you would. Well, possibly for MR you can fly it, but even then, but for for PET you would be able. To well, no, the, the 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 normal practice these days for for MR is that um, um, it's quite common for sites to have some generic ethics that's been agreed to yeah. enable. Um, certain types of scanning without additional ethics approval um, but you, do, you don't it's, it's not like the old days where you could just jump on a, sc on a scanner um, it, that, that's almost impossible to do at least in Manchester yeah yeah no same same at ours uh, uh, and I think for pet it's just more yes are there so uh, yeah I, I my feeling is we need to come back to other initiatives and, and sort of maybe help people in another initiative to make this happen and tie up to it. But, uh... As to as Tommy's, <coughs> well, locally that would be a part, well, I guess the DP UK yeah. and um, Cancer Research UK. Yeah. Do the manufacturers have rights to do this on them with their own equipment? Um, they never give patient data. Most of them don't ever acquire any. There's always the stories of that it's doing the MRI, but that must be some time goes to they only doing so many student scans on as interns. Or well, you need to go to their factory and be scanned. Yeah. Yeah, then they were then they, they were the owners of the data. They're giving you it free if that's with the agreement of the CCP. That's what I mean. All oh, right. Because if they've already accepted that they were giving raw data out to us, then we can go back to one of their ones in the factory and say, could we scan? Uh, the the only only place where I know that this is happening is United Imaging, to the Explorer. <laughs> but it's not an MR, obviously. <laughs> So I, as part of uh, scanner tender processes, I have been scanned and the data has been sent to me and manufacturers have agreed to that. But then, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's implicit that I'm consenting to that for that because they send my data to me. Right. <laughs> uh, but not pet MR, I'm sure. Not pet MR, no, this is MR only. It was for PET MR, but it was MR only. Yeah, sure. Uh, is there anything else we can usefully say at this point? I think, Chris, we need to be clear as to what the obligations are, but I think it's unrealistic that we need to check up on that. I think we just need to have some statements to the people providing data as to, to ensure that they're meeting their obligations. So that could be that could be deliberately vague where we're saying ensure that you have all the necessary ethical permissions and consent from participants 
all the data to be used for the for the for, the, for our stated purposes, um, and ensure that the owner of the data agrees to to the to the the data being transferred, and then it's up to the individuals tr providing the data to check that they have the necessary permissions. Yeah. Uh... In some sense, I guess if we provide, for instance, I forget what it's called now, but we looked last time at this cancer website with data on there. And if we provide pointers and whatever to people that this is where you should say, where, where you, one possible place where you upload your data too, but it's their responsibility and we just uh, provide maybe some some help and then are then able to download it and we've shifted the responsibility to the relevant person. I mean, in practice, it's impossible for us to check that this is being done co correctly because we don't have access to the, to, to the information that we would need. Sure. So I think we have to do this, but equally we have an obligation to, in, to remind researchers of their obligations. Yeah. Um, so that we're not, you know, breaching any um, rights of participants or, or rights of the of the owners of the data. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I had a look at how Adni handles this, and it's sort of the same, uh, except that there is a minimal check on uh, if people are trustworthy, and the minimal check is do you have an academic email and things like that, uh, and they might ask for more. So you have to give a, a reason why you want to do this, but they're not really imposing anything on on uh, on the data that you contribute it's it's your responsibility if you want to but obviously that also means we won't get any <laughs> uh, except when we sort it out for ourselves hopefully uh, okay um, I think we just need to all look at this more, find out more information. And uh, although, uh, so I, I had asked briefly before if Claudia would be interested in uh, try and take this forward. And she said, yes, but what do I need to do? And then the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but so uh, we'll have to have another conversation with her, obviously. I think that's how far we can get today she's not very far so further than we were anyway. all right thank you alex for joining yeah sorry i hadn't realized uh, quite how difficult your particular problem was but uh, <coughs> maybe may, maybe there have been some ideas and uh, always happy to share how far i get with the with the trust yeah. yes yes that, that would be great that would be great Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Um, so we, we're uh, already 12 minutes uh, beyond our uh, time. Uh, I think if people are all right with that, um, because of our late start, uh, probably spend five or ten more minutes and then we call it a day. Apologize for for the delay here. So uh, so I'll therefore go briefly with this. Uh, so papers um, Evgeny has been working on this and then pushing me to share it and I haven't done that yet. So hopefully today a lot of you will get an overleaf link with a uh, uh, the current draft of the paper and then we will need to have some discussion on what needs to be in there. I don't think we'll be doing that right now. Uh, and then Richard uh, is trying to get his head around the paper uh, together with uh, one of our postdocs, uh, Lali, uh, on, on a paper on motion correction uh, for dynamic pet. So those are the two from our consortium directly. Uh, obviously, there's a simulation paper or, or proceedings as well that you've heard about. 
then uh, the future meetings, uh, well, the hackathon, which I have some slides on in a second. Um, we canceled our software meeting for this afternoon because of the hackathon. And uh, I was thinking if a suitable date or uh, probably done already. <laughs> that means. Yes, I guess so. Um, um, if we cycle our venues, uh, the, it would have to be Manchester and somewhere in February seems suitable, roughly. I think we can do a little for that later on, but does that make sense to people? Uh, see anybody saying no anyway? Uh, so the second hackathon, um, oh, I didn't put the dates on here. I'm sorry, um, 17 to 19 here at King's and uh, this, we had some discussion on this in our PCOM and I think we'll need to have a more detailed one later on as well with people who want to uh, attend with, with Andrew and so on, but at the moment that's sort of where we are. Um, so, uh, sort of a dual aim really, one is to get new people on board uh, and train them how to use it and such that they can then have a step at taking some of their existing algorithms that we have an implementation for and try and put that into surf. Um, I have a question mark there on Python only, I don't know if that's feasible or not. It would be easier because otherwise we have to do a bit of catch up on that. App. Yeah, sure. Some things, uh, but um, that's a conversation to have with with your. Yeah, guys. no, it seems to make sense to focus on just Python right. three point whatever. I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay, that would be that would be good. Uh, we do have uh, remaining issues with data from the MMR. Uh, We'll try and get as much done before the, the hackathon, but after all, the hackathon has an aim to write some code. And so there will uh, be a subgroup of people, I think, to uh, continue looking at this issue. Uh, so if you have brain data at the moment with the current tools that we have, everything will be pretty much aligned up to a millimeter or something like that. But if you then go into whole body, then it, things are harder because you do the views and, and MRACs are in different orders and, and all of that fun stuff. And so uh, it would be to look at that. Uh, one question, all, all our test data at the moment is on BB21 acquired. I think 21 is a number I always forget. Um, and I, I believe that King's has upgraded their MMR to the most recent software version. And so there might be issues there that we don't know about. Uh, <coughs> Sorry to interrupt, just to say I do have some lunch here for you all, so I wasn't sure whether you can have All right, oh, Thank that's you. good. Yeah. Have it yes. now or in a if, little bit? Have you started up yet? Yeah. Okay, I'll start setting it up. All right, thank um, you. So I'll just set it up just now. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess Claudia added that on. Yeah, just yeah. for free. Oh, it's always only here until Thursday next week. All so right. Knows, so, yeah. <laughs> so come the hackathon, uh, that'll be me doing that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can compare the comparison. Quality, this is a quality check. You've got to improve upon this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll just okay. go to a better supply. <laughs> Um, and then we, I mean, surf reg branch is in pretty good state, but um, I'm sure it can have another finalization and testing. If we can merge it before the meeting, that would be good. Otherwise, I would say that we, during the meeting, we work from the surf reg branch, really, sure. uh, to be able to do all the resampling and all of that stuff. And uh, as, an, as an aim, I thought it might be useful to get the motion information at the moment is on the post-processing 
registration. So if we can try and get that into the surf itself, that would be a good entity for anything about uh, that. With those are, that was outcome of our discussions. So there's obviously more that we can do. We can think about dynamic data and all of that stuff. But make it feasible. So how does that sound to people? Sounds good. In terms of the very first bullet point train of developers, is it worth sending out a paragraph of things that we should get done before showing up, even to save ourselves two hours, you know, in other words, yeah. Yeah, it's Linux, boring. Python, yeah. basic setup, yeah, yeah. surely. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many people are going to be showing up, but in so, terms of the genuinely new developers, if we're going to get them into Python, Linux, then they should be there with a certain minimal prerequisite yeah. configuration, surely. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, <coughs> from, uh, from King's, uh, Abby, Sam, and uh, Camilla said they would be okay. coming. So uh, I would hope James could make it as well. Yeah. yeah thanks, Martin. Yes. Um, so yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think we need to have some conversation also on on what they expect and where they are interested in. Okay. Chris, can I ask what do you mean with port a few algorithms? So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking... Uh, even one, but they just... My, <laughs> <laughs> well, one is fine. Uh, at least one, let's put it that way. There. So uh, I think Abby is interested in having his... Yeah, he wants to release his uh, synergistic uh, Pedimar right. in Surf, which would be fantastic. Right. For, which would be a win-win. Yeah, and so the, there is, a, there is an implementation that, uh, using the King's uh, code, and I don't know what the, what he's using for the MR side. Uh, it's a good question. I think he's using his own stuff, actually. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in MATLAB, so with like help thing. from plenty of local people. Right. So it's a good hackathon, in other words. So, so basically, he's got everything like projectors for MR and PET on his own. Yeah, I mean, it's well, maybe, sorry, everybody, but I don't yeah, think it's okay. that difficult. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Call sensitivity maps, uh, FFT, and stripping out a few samples is not that difficult. Uh, or maybe I'm missing the point. <laughs> he's done it for it's, one case study. He's done it for his, his papers, whatever he's done. No, but obviously, See, there are, there are the pre-processing mm, yeah, of exactly. all of that, and that stuff he's had very well help. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the core of it is the core, yeah. Yeah. So it makes a good hackathon item because if, it, if, it, if, it's, if it's just an override to something else, it doesn't matter too much, but it's something that could be evaluated. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it worth having that focus even up front? You know, yeah. Let's get a synergistic Pen MR yeah, sure. recon running. In other words, that's all pitching with Abbas's. Mm. I know it sounds a bit, bit but. And then your few algorithms, so whether you mix and match different bits? Yeah, so we could. Right. Um, well, it's good to just have one core pet algorithm, probably map EM with uh, one core um, MR recon method, which will work in the synergistic environment. So yep. just be basically squares. The circle, yeah. Sure. Uh, so he's alternating, yes? Yes. Yeah. So that should be doable. Yeah. And the idea would be replace his steps with Catastron and Surf steps. So either or. Either or, yeah. yeah. You, could, you could realize that one bit may be better to the other one. That's the, that's the simple phase of just sitting down and having a chat about it, looking at the code. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so it, it will have to describe the algorithm well to us. But it's, it's not difficult, it's just alternating between a map EM and then a least squares for, for MR, that's it. And then you just mm -hmm. update uh, yeah. weighting factors uh, based on both reconstructions to have a prior for both reconstructions. It's really very simple. That was one of his motivations was to have a straightforward to implement method. Right. Still having something written would help us rather than you saying very easy. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry. So joy just went like that. So that mean five minutes or what is that? What is I don't know. Translated. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's ready. 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 Okay. It's ready. It'll now. be gone in five minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else is eating our lunch, so we've got to do this quick. Uh, <laughs> uh, simple. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's have a conversation with him. Maybe. Yeah. And um, Andrew had had a, a comment about Python three. So I'm not sure at the minute we are ready. Oh, I, I think we are, aside from virtual machine and spider stuff. But if you right, it, yeah. It's okay. uh, but yeah, we'll have to go. We'll have to see. If it's yeah, exactly. So I mean, so far we've really focused on Python two, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I've run it with Python three. Well, I mean, that's a good a good way to discover where we are, have problems with Python three. Okay. So just very briefly mention we are thinking. I don't know if you're doing anything about uh, the SMRM study group. Right. So I contacted. Well, I asked to post a question on their Slack channel, and the only person who replied was Florian Noll, who's the person who's put up the thousands of knee images, and he said that he thought that there was something at the main society was organizing, but he seems unclear as well as to what's going on. So the reproducible research study group doesn't seem particularly active in ISMRM, to be honest. Okay. Which is not, not good news from this point, this perspective. Yeah. Well, find out if yeah. it happens, it happens. If not. <coughs> And we do. Uh, I have a few, uh, I think one slide on the MIC 2019 one. Uh, so, uh, talked about it with Phil Withers, again, who's very supportive of CCPI joining in this effort. Um, we're not sure if we can get it through the, the uh, MIC organizing committee. Um, they, want, they have proposals for many workshops and uh, it will need a bit of lobbying and that is, yeah, I mean, Dimitra Barambara is the chair, is very supportive. Uh, Dimitri Svisvik is organizing the workshops, is maybe slightly less supportive. Um, so, and, and possibly with good reasons, you know, but anyway, so he needs to be convinced. Right? So I'm not 100% sure if this is going to go ahead. It seemed to be all too early to decide. Uh, Harry's been pushing this quite nicely. Uh, he's been given a draft program to them. Uh, this sort of invite the talks and then contributions on, on three different teams, uh, all squeezed into one day, which would be quite busy, but possibly doable. Uh, so we're, we're pursuing that, and hopefully by February or so, we would know if this goes ahead or not. Hopefully earlier, but I don't know. Uh, and then I, I just thought I'd raise if we do something like organize a reconstruction challenge, like image registration challenges have been done before, uh, where we would provide the software um, that people could use for, for their data. Uh, is something, it's still a bit too early, but in a year's time, roughly, as the, is that something we should be aiming for? Is it something physical or online? <coughs> or undecided? So these challenges normally work by you, you, you supply some data and they run their algorithms and then it comes back and then there is some kind of evaluation, which is the tricky bit in this case. So you just give them low count pet data or an unsampled MR. <coughs> And then you keep the fully really sampled yeah. stuff as your <coughs> okay, that would work. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> unusual samples. Sorry? Unusual samples, unusual objects, see whether they can detect them. Otherwise they you don't want to give them something they know. <laughs> well no, but if you've only given them ten percent of the raw yeah. data, then yeah, they're doing yeah, extremely yeah. well if they can compete yeah. with hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Mm. Obviously, it would have to be with either counting data or simulated data. At this point. But uh, is that something to 
brainstorm about. Would that lead to a publication or something? I apologise for interrupting again. Sure. Would you like your lunch in here, or would you prefer to have it out there in the breakout area? Oh, we'll, we'll just go over there. We're going fine. back. Yeah, yeah. We're we'll we'll trying to stop talking. So yeah. the sandwiches are unwrapped and exposed. Aren't no, they? so they're <laughs> currently covered. <laughs> oh, they are. Okay. They're, they're sort of in a platter box, so they're covered at the moment, but the crisps are exposed. More <laughs> importantly, <laughs> they're so. oxidising. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I just thought I'd double check. Okay, all right, that's fine. I'll leave you guys to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think. Is that something that people are in? I think if it leads to a paper or something, that'd be nice. Yeah. If it doesn't, is it still a good advert for? Well, it's a good advert for sure. If if you, I mean, if you, if you can do it with saying, well, here is some software you can use this stuff. Uh, <coughs> they can use their own if they want to, but it will be challenging to do a truly petamaric construction with their own software. So it would be a good advert. I think if we, if if our stuff is uh, of decent quality by then, <laughs> uh, but it's not easy to organize. I think it'd definitely be a good idea if it leads more people developing more algorithms, that means more citations on your papers. Sure. Okay, let's let's. I've seeded a. Uh, <laughs> uh, then just finally, uh, so the Castor people from uh, France are quite interested in having some kind of connection, mostly uh, because they can't do a lot. So uh, this is a quote from email from Simon Stut and, and good contact, uh, and they're willing to come over to discuss more and to, for us to go over there it would take effort uh, but even a minimal thing for cross-validation might be something to, might be something useful that they set up so i think that would be good to have something else and stir somehow in there uh, their their code is very different from stir it's essentially an executable that you call with 500 options to do whatever you want to do so it's going to look different uh, and integrating that into serve fully would be would be very challenging but to have minimal functionality might be okay they're interested which is good small work bad All right. anything else no okay uh, just a reminder, and then uh, thank you for staying until the well, half an hour late, I suppose. Uh, next time, we'll make sure that the Zoom starts on time as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all online as well. Bye. <laughs>